start recording. All right, so um, all attendees are going to be muted for the duration of this presentation. Um, Charlie is going to take questions at the end. Uh, so if you'd like to submit your questions, you can act, either submit them throughout the presentation using the Q&A icon um, in your Zoom window. And there are instructions here on how to do that, whether you're on your desktop or on mobile. Uh, you can also raise your hand and I will ask you to unmute um, if you'd like to share a comment or a story or a question for Charlie. Um, if you prefer to do it verbally, you can do it that way. Um, so feel free to use either way for the Q&A. Um, we are recording this presentation, uh, so it will be available if you've missed some part of it, if you have to leave early, if you arrive late. Um, you will have access to it later. Uh, we will share the link out to everyone who registered after the fact once it's available. Uh, we are not providing the slides because you will have access to this presentation. Um, and that is all I have for you. Um, so if you have any questions throughout the presentation, again, you can use that Q&A icon at the bottom, um, or you can wait until the end and um, raise your hand so I can ask you to unmute. Uh, we have a, a very great crowd here. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and hand this over to Judy Knudsen, the manager of our Center for Local History, to introduce our speaker, Charlie Clark. Um, our, good evening. Uh, I am Judy Knudsen from the Center for Local History, and I want to welcome everyone to this program. Uh, and Charlie Clark, who's going to speak to us this evening, uh, about a, a somewhat unknown uh, period in Arlington's history. Uh, Charlie is a, a longtime journalist in the Washington DC area, and he also writes a weekly column for the Falls Church News Press, which is our man in Arlington. Uh, over the years, he's been a frequent visitor to the Center for Local History and has written several books about Arlington's history, all of which I highly recommend. Uh, he has a new book out, uh, which is a, a departure from his usual writing. It's um, it's called My Gap Year, Reinterpreted, and it's a, a rewrite of a diary he wrote when he was 18 and uh, during a nine month, nine month hitch hiking tour of nine countries in Europe and, and in North Africa. So be on the lookout for that. Um, but now it is my great pleasure to turn the program over to Charlie. All right. Let's see. Share screen. Oh, you have to unshare. Yes, I'm going to stop sharing right now. Okay. okay. Is that all right? Can people see that? I see it, but it's uh, not in presentation mode yet. Okay, so we go. Okay, how's that everybody? That's great. Welcome to this grim topic, but it, it remains fascinating after all these years. Uh, just this summer, uh, as the campaign uh, season heated up, there's lots of references, uh, hostile rhetoric uh, involving Nazi themes. Uh, there's a, a, a murder defendant in Reston, I was just reading in, in August, who uh, his uh, social media had all kinds of uh, praise for uh, Adolf Hitler. And uh, just last year on a pleasanter note, the uh, public broadcasting service did a wonderful British drama called uh, Ridley Road in which uh, George Lincoln Rockwell was portrayed uh, coming over to England in, in, in 1962. So it's, um, it's a, a topic that is uh, still with us uh, regrettably and uh, I wanted to show people uh, a little more about why uh, Arlington is linked to this dramatic uh, national story. Uh, this is a picture which I will go into more detail on later, but it was taken in August of 2017 uh, on the uh, 50th anniversary of the assassination of George Lincoln Rockwell, which took place right uh, at the Dominion Hills Shopping Center on uh, Wilson Boulevard. Now, the, uh, when I was a child, uh, we would drive uh, through Arlington with my parents and we would see uh, the Nazis uh, headquarters, uh, which I'll show you in a minute. 
Uh, my neighbors up the street where I grew up were, were the L Levine family who uh, were the founders and owners of Mario's Pizza. They were a Jewish family. And this is a shot of Rockwell protesting the fact that uh, he would not, uh, they wouldn't serve him and his uh, party mates. And uh, it, uh, it just showed you how uh, it was just so strange uh, in only 15 years after World War II, uh, 15 years after a lot of Arlingtonian veterans were fighting the Nazis, that these characters were running around here. Um, so I'll give you a little background on Rockwell himself. So he, he was born in 1918 in Bloomington, Illinois, and his parents were vaudeville actors, uh, and he grew up with dinner conversations with uh, celebrities like uh, Fanny Bryce and, and Fred Allen. And uh, he went off, uh, they moved to, to uh, Maine in later years and he, he went to uh, Brown University, he went to a private school in New England, he went to Brown University and the, uh, the Pratt Institute where he studied uh, art. And uh, in the end of World War II and then again in the, during the Korean War, he was in the Navy uh, as a, commander and uh, he was stationed during that na the naval years in Iceland. And there he met uh, and married as a second marriage, married an Icelandic woman. And they read uh, Hitler's Mein Kampf in the early 50s. And then they honeymooned in Berchtesgaden outside of Munich, which was Hit Hitler's retreat. And um, let's see. Uh, it was in the late 1950s that Rockwell uh, uh, decided that he wanted to launch what became the American Nazi Party. And why did he choose Arlington, Virginia? Well, it's because we were a Southern state. There was still a lot of sympathy for segregation of schools and uh, still a lot of uh, racial uh, tensions and uh, white supremacy uh, among a, a, a lot of more mainstream people still. And it was also outside of the nation's capital, which meant there was a big media uh, presence, which uh, he would use to his advantage in his protests. So he was able to rent this house, which is about four blocks from my house. It's on Williamsburg Boulevard in Sycamore. Uh, and he was funded by uh, a, a man named Harold Aerosmith, who was an heir to the Dun and Bradstreet fortune. Uh, but who was a sympathizer to Rockwell's ideology. And uh, he was in this house for, for several years until it was uh, raided by the Commonwealth's attorney, William J. Hassan, who will show up later in this story too. Uh, in April, 1959, uh, the police got a search warrant and they came in, they found a pistol, rifles, and about 10,000 anti-Jewish pamphlets and 100 neighbors looked on as the Nazis marched in and out of the house doing the Sig Heil salute. And several were charged with disorderly conduct. And a lot of people that I grew up with uh, will remember driving by this house and seeing uh, a, a light in the uh, picture window with, with the uh, Nazi flag and the swastika. Um, there was a... Uh, so Rockwell uh, had four children with this Icelandic wife, Thora, and uh, a friend of mine, Sandy Harwell, remembers being a classmate of Ricky Rockwell at Nottingham Elementary. And then one day, Ricky announced that he was moving and he never saw him again. This is a picture of Rockwell with his family. So the Nazis set up, uh, they, were, they had a printing business that allowed them to earn some money. And they, uh, were publicity hounds. They uh, organized a lot of rallies. They picketed uh, the movie Exodus. Uh, they picketed uh, downtown uh, a nightclub appearance by the uh, uh, black comedian, Sammy Davis. They uh, organized rallies at the Ellipse uh, near the White House. And they went up to New York City where they, where they were eventually uh, a band. They were there doing a visit by the Israeli president, Ben Gurion. Uh, it was in 1962 that the Virginia General Assembly uh, condemned Rockwell as an enemy of the state. He began to show up in, in pop culture. Uh, he 
Bob Dylan mentions him in his song called the John Birch Paranoid Blues. Uh, in 1966, he gave a detailed interview to Playboy magazine and the uh, interviewer was one Alex Haley, who would go on to write the autobiography of Malcolm X and then in the late 70s, the TV drama Roots. Uh, and, which, and in the TV version of Roots, uh, he, uh, George Lincoln Rockwell was played by Marlon Brando. So they, uh, they also traveled around the country, the Nazis, they uh, disrupted civil rights rallies down south. Uh, and they spoke on a lot of, of college campuses. That's how Rockwell earned a lot of his money with speaking fees. And in 1965, Rockwell ran for governor and he got 6,366, 63, I'm sorry, 6,366 votes. So this is a shot of the house 928 North Randolph Street. It's, it's now a, a high rise apartment in Boston. But I remember this when I was, would drive by it asking my parents what, what the heck that sign meant, white man fight helped smash the black revolution now. And you can see some of his cronies uh, sitting out in front of it. And there was a couple of famous episodes uh, where uh, a Washington Lee student named Ricky Farber, who was Jewish, uh, walked by the house one day and uh, they had an exchange of words and the, he, the, not the Nazi, uh, was ran out and grabbed him and took him into the house and they tied him up and scared him and eventually they were arrested and convicted of, of kidnapping. Uh, there's other stories uh, about um, the Nazis uh, uh, harassing uh, uh, student black student athletes too and I, I later heard uh, Reggie Harrison, the uh, famous WNL graduate who went on to play pro football, say that he was laughing when the Nazis were using the n-word on him they called him a big fat n-word and he said i don't like people calling me fat uh and inside the uh members of the nazis that you know maybe uh, 30 or so in, in this location uh there was uh, a couple of jewish members one of which was daniel burroughs who would, would go on to commit suicide and uh the, the there was uh testimony about what life was like living inside this house uh where rockwell supposedly uh hogged all the food and, and uh, there was a lot, a lot of tension between uh, people who were, were unemployed. Um, here you have this uh, close up of the same house and they have their hours as if they, they really uh, would like visitors. Uh, you can imagine how scary it might be to, to visit him. And uh, they did have a craving for uh, publicity. You got to remember that and I'll get to that in a second. And uh, so they invited uh, a photographer from the Northern Virginia Sun, uh, Xander Hollander, and a, 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 a reporter and a part-time uh, photographer named Jack Hiller. And Jack was a high school teacher in Virginia. He came, came to one of my earlier talks on this uh, subject and uh, shared with me some of the pictures. Uh, here, here's the uh, crew uh, tells you about how many, it looks like about 20 or so in front of the same house on Randolph Street. And uh, here is the interior of the house and the Jack Hiller took these pictures. They're preparing to go downtown to a big rally on the mall. Now it's interesting in, in December of 1965, the IRS locked the party out of this Randolph Street house for failure to pay taxes, it's about $7,000. And they confiscated their printing equipment which forced the Nazis to move they moved the printing down to Fredericksburg, Virginia, but uh, they had they set up in another uh, temporary location and then in a, in a house lit out, which I'll get to in just a second. Uh, now here's Rockwell. Uh, people I've I've spoken to, spoken to lots of people who met him, and he was charismatic. Uh, he was six foot four. Uh, a 19 year old William and Mary student tape recorded an interview with him back in 67. And he said, he never hesitates when he speaks. He almost glows with confidence. It's easy to see how he can use his power on ignorant people. And uh, Ruby Pierce, who was an employee of the Dominion Hills uh, laundromat, the Econo wash, uh, who was present when he was assassinated, may have been the last person to talk to him. She, she was saying he was polite and charming. He was tall and handsome and looked like a businessman. 
And I have a theory myself that having read a fair amount about him is that one of his so-called skills would be that he is willing to shock people and he would make uh, death threats and disparaging comments, racist comments about blacks or Jews and just calmly watch people's uh, uh, eyes widen. And I think that he was kind of inured to that sort of uh, criticism and rejection. So uh, after they were kicked out of the uh, Randolph Street house in Boston, they moved to this house that a widow named Kern uh, leased to them. I mean, she probably wasn't as uh, aware of their exact ideology when she signed this deal. But this is on Upton Hill. Today, of course, it's Upton Hill Regional Park. And uh, back when the Nazis were living there from like 65 to uh, 68, it was uh, known as, nickname is Hatemonger Hill. And it was, uh, they called it their barracks. And they had uh, some guard dogs out there, but uh, a reporter friend of mine, Ken Eikenberry, uh, told me that those dogs were, their, their bark was uh, more scarier than their, than their bite. Uh, and then the other thing that, we should get into before uh, I move on is that there was resistance to the Nazis in Arlington. We can talk about this a little bit later, uh, but because of the desire they had for publicity, that the newspapers like the Washington Post, Washington Star, which is really bigger than the Post at this time, and the uh, Daily News were reluctant to cover the Nazis every time they picketed or protested because it just seemed like that's, it was playing into their hands. So it was kind of an informal uh, quarantine. And the big exception to that was Herman Obermeyer, who was the editor and owner, uh, publisher of the Northern Virginia Sun. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about him, him later at the end. And then finally, there was a group formed called the Citizens Concerned and it was a lot of Jewish families, many of whom were the parents of the Jewish classmates that I had growing up here. And uh, the Reverend Yount of uh, First Presbyterian Church, about 50 people. And they met in the living room, I think in the Planck's house in uh, off Pershing Drive to try and uh, make sure that the county and, and the police department were uh, doing everything they could to uh, expose any wrongdoing in the Nazis. And there was, there, there was a lot of rumors that there maybe there were some uh, uh, illegitimate children that weren't being cared for. And they, they just wanted to see what you could do within the confines of the, of the First Amendment. So here's a picture of Rockwell at, at a downtown rally. And to his left is a man named John Patler, who had uh, worked for him uh, since about 1960. And the column I've written for the Falls Church paper for this week is about him, by the way. It'll come out tomorrow and on, online on Friday. But uh, Patler was a Greek American and he uh, was pretty confused in his politics. He kind of went back and forth between Marxism and uh, National Socialism. And, uh, but he, um, his, he, his real name was Pat Salos, but he changed it to Patler because so, it sounded like Hitler. Uh, and uh, he also was advocating to change the name of the American Nazi party eventually was changed to the National Socialist White People's Party. So on the, the red letter day in Nazi party history was August 25th, 1967. The Rockwell had driven down from the barracks, which is just two blocks uh, from the Upton Hill down to the uh, shopping center. And uh, he went in and spoke to the proprietor of the uh, Conawash, and then he realized he had forgotten his bleach. So he came out uh, and got in that car and then shots rang out from the rooftop. And uh, he was lay splattered on the ground with uh, a copy of the New York Daily News. Uh, and uh, one of the, uh, the people I, who came to one of my talks on this, uh, Ken Usiker, witness, uh, uh, he came and saw the body lying on the ground. He told me that it, he saw the blood on his forehead and chest and he, he, he thought that, uh, that it was, a, uh, somebody had said it was a heart attack, but he could tell right away that uh, the blood was on his head uh, and, and that he was probably dead. So then there followed a, a big dramatic chase and I had to put this together reading a variety of clippings and a couple of books. 
Uh, here is the coverage uh, of the Northern Virginia Sun. That's Herman Obermeyer's paper. And uh, I, I have a memory of this when I was a child. Uh, and he was lucky, or Herman o was lucky that his reporter got there first. And uh, uh, the, it, it became uh, international news, of course. And there's uh, Patler uh, in handcuffs. So um, I'll go back a little bit. So the chase was that uh, the barbershop, Tom's Barbershop, which is still there, by the way, it's still called Tom's, although it has a different owner. Uh, I interviewed Tom Blankeny, who was retired by the time I got to him down in Fredericksburg. But he's, he talked about he, how he and his, his uh, fellow barber uh, ran uh, after uh, this gunman uh, down uh, Liberty Street. Uh, and uh, he, they, uh, were, they, he realized in retrospect that he was endangering his own life. So that was probably a mistake. Uh, uh, and and he, he, he came out of the barbershop and saw Rock, Rockwell jumping around in the front seat. I thought he was having a seizure, he said. So his, his uh, fellow barber, Jim Cummings, they took off and uh, eventually they, they lost sight of him. So they stopped in the home of a woman and asked her if she'd seen the man run by and then she dialed the police. And uh, that call to the police is what steered the, them to pick up uh, Patler. Uh, now, Patler was known to these uh, police uh, men. They, they had been monitoring the Nazis. Although there are some rumors that some of the police officers were sympathetic to the, to the white supremacist cause. Uh, but he, uh, a, a cap, a baseball type cap uh, was found in, in the yard. And then uh, eventually uh, an Arlington policeman waded into Four Mile Run Creek right there uh, at the bottom of the hill off of uh, Liberty Street and found uh, the Sturman pistol, which was turned out to be the, the murder weapon. And uh, Patler was found at a bus stop at Washington Boulevard and Inglewood with his trousers wet from the knee down. And that was uh, what they pieced that together later that he had been wading into, into the creek. Now, this was also, this became front page news uh, all over the world, too. I should emphasize that. Uh, and Rockwell's own father uh, said he just, you know, he, he knew that this was going to happen to his son one day. Rockwell was estranged from all of his family except his mother. She stuck with him uh, through all this. So then you had a, a, a fiasco in the burial of uh, Rockwell. They, remembering that he's a Navy veteran, so he's entitled to burial. Uh, at a some kind of national cemetery and uh, Arlington Cemetery was ruled out. And so they chose the Culpeper National Cemetery. But the Nazis uh, were uh, challenged, the rule, the uh, army of, uh, officials said that they would not permit the wearing of Nazi uh, regalia, swastikas uh, in, into the cemetery. So they had a stalemate, the, the limousine, the hearse got there and the, uh, they wouldn't let, let the, the Nazis into the cemetery. So Rockwell ended up being cremated and his successor, a man named Matt Kale, who didn't have anywhere near the charisma of uh, Rockwell, uh, eventually uh, took the, uh, the ashes we, we think up to Wisconsin. Um, now, Patler, I should go into a little bit of his trial. So, uh, he was, uh, the, the prosecutor was the same William J. Hassan, who uh, also lived in my neighborhood. I knew him growing up. Uh, he wanted to uh, seek the death penalty. And, uh, but uh, you gotta remember that there's mixed feelings about the killing of Rockwell. So, I mean, yes, this is the murder and yes, they have to enforce the law, but there's, there's people who think that Rockwell got what he deserved. So, and then, of course, in Virginia, it's, unlike most states, uh, the juries determine not just guilt or innocence, but also the sentencing. So um, uh, Patler is represented by a team of lawyers, one of whom is Helen Lane. I've written about her, too. She was a very conservative member of the Arlington School Board in the, in the 50s, went to law school later. And, uh, and uh, they, they um, finally, uh, the jury of... I have it's 10 men and two women. They took four hours. They found Patler guilty and they sentenced him to 20 years uh, in prison. 
and he tried to appeal that to the Virginia Supreme Court. And uh, he uh, was eventually paroled after just slightly under eight years total. There were some other legal uh, issues there. And uh, he went back uh, to New York City and changed his name to back to his original John uh, Christ Patsalos. And uh, he became a uh, commercial artist, freelance cartoonist uh, in New York City. So then you have uh, the Nazis clear out of the Kate Mogger Hill uh, house on Upton Hill, and they move to Courthouse Clarendon area on uh, near Edgewood Street, which uh, many of us remember as the Java Shack. Uh, back at the time uh, in 68 and into the 70s, the Nazi party was sharing uh, the building with um, a dental office. Um, uh, L Lucas, uh, I'll think of his name in a sec, was the landlord too. And he, once again, they, they have a habit of moving into places under, uh, without revealing their identities, you know, under assumed uh, identities. And uh, the Java Shack, uh, by the way, uh, over the years, uh, the owner of that place told me that he would find uh, Nazi uh, business cards and photographs and things uh, behind uh, the uh, medicine chest in the bathroom, or whatever. That went on for years. And during the 2016 election, there was fake news on the internet that uh, that the American Nazi Party uh, was was uh, active in Arlington, and that uh, the Java Shack was its, its headquarters. And uh, so he had to deal with a lot of that, a little bit of, of, of telephone harassment. Uh, the Nazis then stayed organized from that location. And uh, here they are marching in the Bicentennial Parade in Arlington on Wilson Boulevard in July, 1976. And uh, they, uh, uh, they also, uh, they had a telephone uh, uh, tape, uh, tape recording, uh, one of their, the offshoots was a, a white power group. It was based in Crystal City and it was run by a, a man named William Pierce. He wrote this, the uh, book called The Turner Diaries, which is a fantasy about a race war in, in the United States. And uh, Timothy McVeigh supposedly was influenced by that before he bombed the Oklahoma City uh, Federal Building. And, uh, the, the Nazis continued to um, uh, participate in uh, Arlington politics. Uh, they had tried uh, to rent the Yorktown High School uh, building to have an evening meeting. And they tried to do this as far back as 1971, which is right after I graduated from Yorktown. And uh, the ACLU defended their right to do that, but, but it the school board rejected it uh, as inflammatory and it went to court and then it got stalemated and stalled. And it finally, the, the litigation was renewed. And, and in 1983, this is 12 years later, they finally did the, these Nazi successors uh, had made, tried to make their ideological point by holding a, a white power meeting in the Yorktown High School facilities. The party then by the 1980s was uh, led by uh, a man named Harold Covington. And the odd coincidence is that Covington went to high school with my wife in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And he ran for, uh, I think it's Senate, a primary for Senate down in North Carolina back in the, in the 1980s. Uh, he went under the name uh, Winston Smith, which is the name of the central character in George Orwell's 1984 but Covington died in 2008. So in 1983, the Nazis packed up out of Arlington and they moved to New Berlin, Wisconsin. Uh, the gun uh, that Patler used uh, to kill Rockwell uh, is still owned by the uh, Arlington uh, court system, but it is at an undisclosed location. So then I want to talk back to the beginning of this slide. So. In August of 19, uh, 2017, you'll recall that was when the violence in Charlottesville took place and the uh, 
neo-Nazis were there in force marching with torch like torchlight and the, the woman was killed uh, by a man in a car who was also a Nazi follower. So I had a hunch that the Nazis, the neo-Nazis would return to the site of the assassination of Rockwell on the 50th anniversary. And uh, they had returned there on the 10th anniversary of it. There's a picture of them and saluting back then. And so uh, a few days before the 25th, I went, went into the, several of the stores in the Dominion Hill Shopping Center and left my business card and asked them to call me uh, noonish. You know, I, I, I should have had the exact time in mind too, because that's um, probably the way these people think, the exact time of his death. So uh, meanwhile, uh, an NBC, local NBC news crew had asked me to be their sort of Sherpa and take them around that day to show them the four or five locations of where the Nazis uh, had their houses. And so we were standing in front of Mario's Pizza uh, doing an interview with Alan Levine, who uh, is no longer with us, but he's my boyhood friend and the owner of Mario's Pizza. And he was telling the news crew about his father uh, turning a garden hose on the Nazis when they were protesting in front of Mario's. But we got this frantic call from the current owner of Tom's Barbershop he said that the Nazis are here. So we jumped in the van and we just made it there in time to get the, this photograph that one of the barbershop customers took and just gave it to us. And I published it in the Falls Church News Press and the NBC uh, local station, Mark Seagraves, published it instantly. And uh, you can see that there's a one woman and they all have these white shirts. And you know, a friend of mine wanted me to try and identify these people and you know maybe get them in trouble but that's not what I do as a journalist but you can see the the harsh feelings and then finally uh, I wanted to recommend two books that if you want to go in depth uh, Frederick Simonoli's American Fuhrer and uh, William Schmaltz uh, I must say that their coverage well in depth in many many ways it's more na national in scope and they don't quite have the Arlington detail that uh, I feel like that I've tried to provide. And uh, Judy, they, these were, I think, deaccessioned at some point by the library over the years. They used to have them. And uh, I don't know, somebody maybe didn't recognize that they had an Arlington angle to it, but that's all right. Uh, you all can listen to uh, uh, Zoom uh, <laughs> lectures by uh, journalists like me and still get a good, uh, a good understanding of it, I hope. And then finally, I wanted to give a tribute to one other source is, is Herman Obermeyer, who uh, when, when I was a kid, he was a familiar figure because he was the owner of the Sun Gazette. Uh, now it's called Sun Gazette, Northern Virginia Sun. He bought it in 1959 or 60 from some New Deal liberals and he turned it into a more conservative paper. And uh, he uh, covered the Nazis presence in a lot of detail. Uh, Herman was Jewish. He had attended the Nuremberg trials as a young soldier in 1945, and he felt very strongly that they needed to be monitored and exposed. And Rockwell corresponded with him, and they had a kind of a dueling letters. I've read read some of the letters, and uh, Herman published uh, a lot of his photographs. So they ended up at the Neiman Center in Harvard University, but a, a lot of the collection from the Sun Gazette in a, a, a paperback, which I have copies of. And then uh, I got to know Herman personally, uh, he died about three, four years ago, but uh, in like 2014, 15, uh, he hired me to be on a, a part-time member of his staff. I still had my day job. So I would go over there uh, once or twice a week. And uh, he wanted to reassemble uh, and do a better version of his book on the American Nazi party. and. Uh, the role that he had played in uh, keeping them in the in the uh, mon monitored in the limelight, and uh, unfortunately, the 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 book we, we never got to do it. His time came, and uh, but I wanted to just thank him for um, his input on this too. So that's my presentation, and uh, as Judith said, I'm happy to take questions. But also, if people have comments or anecdotes, uh, I'd be happy to listen, uh, hear those too, which I always learn something too from the audience on this. So thank you. 
Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Charlie. Um, we have had a few questions come in during the presentation. Um, Alan asks, uh, which of the present stores in the Dominion Hills retail strip was Rockwell shot in front of? Well, let's see. I'm trying to visualize the way it looks today. I mean, Tom's Barbershop is the really the, the key to it. The Econo Wash is no longer there. Let's go back. If you want me to go back to, uh, let's see, there's a hairstylist. You know, now you have the Meridian Pint and you, you have a, 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 a shoe repair and, and uh, laundry, uh, but you don't have, uh, you have a soccer and sports store. But the Tom's Barbershop is still there. So you can see where the barbershop is in this picture. Thank you. Um, and I see Jerry has his hand raised. So I'm going to allow him to talk and ask him to unmute. Let's see if he'll. Um, Jerry, if you still have, oh, there you go. No, I, my hand was raised, but it was a mistake. So I don't have any questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Jerry. Um, how about Elizabeth? You also had your hand raised. I'm going to ask you to unmute. Hi there. It's actually Bill Fogarty with uh, my wife, Elizabeth, here. Um, I just thought I'd share a quick anecdote. And uh, uh, Charlie, we, I can give more details later, but in 1958, there was a bomb threat at the Unitarian Church of Arlington. Yes. And um, there was a rabbi who was speaking that day. Um, it was a, um, you know, they were sharing pulpit, so to speak. And there was a bomb threat, and um, they didn't know who uh, called it in. The next week, the rabbi came again, and one of our ushers has a great uh, oral interview where he said he was in the back of the church, and there's this real nice-looking man, very clean cut, in the back of the church. And it was George Lincoln Rockwell. Oh, wow. And um, back in those days for the Unitarian Church, there was a membership book there and anybody could sign it. And apparently Rockwell told uh, uh, the usher uh, that he was raised Unitarian, uh, uh, I guess, early in his life. And they were so afraid he would sign the membership book, they hid the membership book. Um, but outside uh, the church, the American Nazis had put pamphlets on every uh, windshield. And uh, when the usher walked out of the church, he saw all these uh, Nazis in brown shirts in the church uh, parking lot. Um, so it's pretty amazing. And I have a copy of one of the pamphlets if you ever want to take. Oh, it. wow. Yeah, yeah. So I'll, uh, again, it's Bill Fogarty. Just uh, get in touch with me and I, I'll have some more information on that. Well, thank you. That's a great story. You know, mm -hmm. I think the reason that that Unitarian Church was targeted for the bomb threat was that they were hosting the Jewish uh, parishioners who hadn't built their own uh, temple yet. And that's why uh, Rockwell got so mad at them. Mm -hmm. mm. Thank you. Great Bill. story. Thank you. Um, we've had a number of questions come in from people. Uh, two questions that keep repeating. Why did Pat Lara shoot Rockwell? What did he hope to achieve? What was his motive? And what happened to the Rockwell family, his wife and children after the assassination? Uh, good questions all. So Patler had a, a complicated relationship with Rockwell. He, he, he saw him as his mentor, but uh, he was also very independent uh, and, you know, wanted to sort of start his own organization. And he quit and came back several times. And then there's a rumor, which is in one of the books uh, the, that I mentioned, that Rockwell was also... Uh, slept with Patler's wife and that there that he Patler acknowledged that and uh so there was some competitiveness there um and uh Patler is a pretty disturbed he had a, a rough upbringing too his own father uh killed his mother and uh he has children who have uh his son uh, John Patler Jr has written on his father so that's where we learned some of this Washington Post did some coverage of that. And uh, Rockwell's uh, children and his ex-wife, I think took new names. I think they went back to Iceland 
and uh, it's hard to track them down because they don't use the names anymore. Okay, and um, Leslie, you have your hand up, so I'm going to ask you to unmute. Hey, um, I have an interesting anecdote about the 30th anniversary of um, the, the assassination of, of George Lincoln Rockwell. My daughter, who's now 40, was a, um, we belong to the Dominion Hills Pool. And she, as a 14 year old, was working at the front desk. And suddenly she sees these people marching by. And she says they were on the far side of Wilson Boulevard walking towards the shopping center. And she says she remembers seeing the flag and thinking, gosh, is that, is that a Nazi flag? And then there was a gust of wind that blew the flag so she could see it clearly. And um, at first she couldn't, as I said, she couldn't tell what it was, but then the, the gust of wind. So she was completely freaked out. Um, uh, I'm Jewish, so of course she, she had a good uh, understanding of, of Nazism and the Holocaust. And um, it was, you know, it, she says she'll never, she'll never forget it. Wow. And she says, I, I actually snapped a photo of your photo of the 2017. And she said she remembers them wearing the, you know, the same black trousers, white shirts. And oh, stuff. wow. She says there were at least twice as many people in that march as were um, in your photograph of 2017. Well, thank you. Uh I wanted to add, uh, my wife is always nudging me to remember to add this. So that day in 2017, when those eight Nazis returned for just 10 minutes, uh, the, the good citizens of Dominion Hills on Facebook organized a flash mob for that night to have a we uh, hate has no home here rally at the Dominion Hills shopping center. My wife and I then attended that. And there were 70 or 80 people there just to say that uh, that those characters who were there earlier in the day do not really represent Arlington. So. Well, thank you. This has been absolutely fascinating. Oh, well, good. And I have to tell you that in this happened to her in 1997. And in 1998, I went to work for the Holocaust Museum. Oh, OK. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, we have a comment from Peter who said the building on Franklin Road was actually owned by a sympathizer through an outfit called the Asgard Press. Oh, okay. So just interesting. I will take a look for that. Thank you, Peter. And uh, Michael asks, did you mention that Rockwell had a wealthy patron early on in his Nazi career? Yes, uh, Harold Aerosmith, was a real uh, racist and he was wealthy Baltimorean. And uh, I tracked him down. He, he went over to Germany uh, after the civil rights movement. He just could not deal with the fact that blacks were rising in status in, in America. And so it, he's, the last I heard about him, he was in, in the seventies, he was over in Germany. And so, he died with all this wealth and they tracked down his heir, who was a gentleman living down in Fredericksburg. And I tried to track him down too, but I had no luck with that. But that money from Dunn and Bradstreet is still around. You know, that's like a hundred year old uh, business uh, uh, catalog, uh, you know, Dunn and Bradstreet numbers for different businesses. And then, so uh, it, it's mysterious how uh, Aerosmith was, so, and eventually I think uh, Rockwell, uh, he parted ways. I think they got fed up with each other on tactics. All right, and we have a few questions asking about sort of um, how much support for the Nazis was in the Arlington area. So people have asked, um, is there currently a Nazi or neo-Nazi group active in Northern Virginia? Um, how many Nazis were located in Arlington with Rockwell at that time? Um, can you talk a little bit more about that sort of? Yeah, thing? well, 
nationwide, he probably had, this is just estimates, but he probably had fewer than 100, uh, maybe 30 or 40 in the Washington area. You know, they, they had some followers in uh, the Deep South and uh, in Chicago area. Um, the successor groups, you know, have different names. Uh, there is, ironically, the, I, I mentioned that William Pierce, a white power group in Crystal City. Well, just in the last five or 10 years, this group uh, by uh, Richard Spencer, the, uh, the national, uh, what's it called, the National um, Policy Institute, they were in Crystal City and they uh, were openly white supremacist. They moved to Alexandria about four or five years ago. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the, the History Channel does regular programs on, on hate groups. Uh, and uh, they, it, so it, it's, it's, it's hard to track down, uh, you know, they don't have a headquarters anymore the way they used to. They're, they're completely different from the Rockwell group in that they, they kind of shun publicity, but they show up at these protest events and they certainly show up in social media now in the anonymity of social media. And that's where it's uh, most uh, dangerously, you know, in, in influential uh, and it, it may even play a role in some of these election denial controversies that we're all experiencing right now. And in a similar vein, um, Austin asked, uh, can you give more information on the participation in the 1976 parade? Was there any backlash or counter protests or, um, you know, were people angry about it? Yeah, I think the ACLU got involved again. Uh, and of course, the uh, I, I would have to go read up more on, cause I was out of Arlington at that point. I was off in college, but I could, I could look it up. But you remember the uh, controversy in Skokie, Illinois, that was just a year or two later uh, where the Nazis wanted to march there and uh, they were challenged by the citizenry. A lot of Jewish families in Skokie were upset. And uh, the, again, the ACLU took their, their stand. So, uh, um, but you know, what I find astonishing is when they were marching in the Bicentennial Parade, Everybody who was living in Arlington knew that we had Nazis in our midst by then, but that faded away. And so after the 80s and 90s, uh, and then when I started to do this research, which would be the early 2000s, and I've just accumulated uh, in the last 20 years, but people are stunned. They had no idea. And the younger generation still needs to learn that. It's hard, hard for them to understand how that could happen. Absolutely. And um, I have one more related question and then I'll go to the people who raise their hands. Um, you describe a number of demonstrations uh, that the Nazi, Nazi party did, but only a few actual attacks on non-party members. Were there more assaults on Jewish and African-American members of the Arlington community or were they mostly just demonstrators and picketing? Well, I mentioned the Ricky Farber episode. Um, yeah, I don't think that they were as uh, violent as the ones that we saw in Charlottesville in 2017. Um, they did, uh, they had vans when they went down to, to the deep south in New Orleans and they would uh, confront civil rights uh, protesters. And so there was, they had to be separated by security people. So there was a risk that they would fight, but you know, if you look at these guys, they aren't, they don't look like they're really that tough and that, uh, you know, militarily disciplined, you know, it's really more of a war of uh, angry uh, hate rhetoric. And if you look at their propaganda, they have all these parodies of Anne Frank and uh, they were, several of them were artists, Rockwell included, and they would draw these very unflattering uh, images and, uh, the pamphlets, this gentleman, Mr. Fogarty, who has the pamphlet, I bet you some of those artwork is in that too. It's so, uh, yeah, I don't think they were a, a, as much of a, a spread of violence as just uh, ideology and hatred. All right, Stephen, I'm going to ask you to unmute.
All right, it looks like you are unmuted, Stephen, but I'm not hearing you. Stephen, are you there? All right, we'll come back to Stephen. Um, Stephen, you may also submit through the Q&A. Um, Luis, I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Whoops, now you are. There, go ahead. Hey, this is, can you hear me? This is actually Ken Marshall. Uh, uh, I'm here with Louise, and uh, I was at Rice University when there was a debate between uh, Rockwell as a Nazi and uh, I forget the name of the man. He was a uh, representative of the ACLU. He was arguing as a Jew, and it was evident. I mean, <laughs> many of Rockwell's arguments seemed rather juvenile and adolescent uh, rather than well reasoned. Uh -huh. That's all I'm going to say. It. Well, he 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 was a very impressive looking guy. He was a track. He was uh, you know a handsome guy, and was a large presence behind the podium. No, I would agree with you on the the their propaganda, and I have copies of it in Herman Obermeyer's book. I mean, it's very crude. Uh, you know, childish really. It's it's not. Um, subtle uh at all so i'll leave it at that all right thank you ken and um let's go back here uh somebody asks where did alex haley interview rockwell oh i don't know the answer to that you know those those playboy interviews are done wherever the author and the subject get together and, and they have a long process of transcribing them and then editing them down. So I would have to look that up. <laughs> people, modern people have forgotten how influential Playboy interviews used to be back in the 60s and 70s. It was uh, a lot of famous authors and politicians were interviewed in Playboy. Uh, okay. And somebody else asked, um... When we were talking about the Unitarian Church earlier, they asked if it was the same Unitarian Church uh, on Route 50 at 50 in George Mason that is yes. now home to a Jewish Reconstructionist congregation. Yes, uh, yeah. that's a partial. Uh, I mean, that's not the only people who use that building. Uh, there's still a Unitarian congregation, I believe. And and of course, the Jewish temple at Tyam is just down the road a little bit on Fillmore. So that's um, that whole situation has changed. And then Rodolph Shalom Temple was built in McLean after that. But at the time, there was a the Unitarian Church became uh, the actually the, the Arlington Jews were meeting in the uh, the upstairs from the public shoe store in Clarendon. That's where they, they got started, too. Oh, wow. And um, somebody else asked, have you ever tried to see if the um, have you ever tried to get FBI files on Rockwell? I personally have not. No, it's uh, I think that these two professors, uh, Simonelli and William Schmidt, who wrote the books, uh, did did do that. And uh, if you look in the back of the book, though, there's footnotes to FBI files. Yeah. That's cool. Uh, Randy asked, can you tell the full story of Mario's pizza? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was started in about 1956 by Howard Levine. And uh, they, I played on their little league baseball team uh, and they had a mini golf there for a while. And uh, I don't know why uh, Rockwell's people um, picked on them uh, because they didn't, they wouldn't have known that Howard Levine was Jewish. Uh, he picked the name Mario's to sound like he was an Italian. And so uh, somehow that that got out and uh, uh, Levine wasn't going to uh, uh, put up with having these guys wearing swastikas in his pizza parlor. And so uh, Rockwell made a big point about it. And uh, 
then Al Alan sold Mario's about 10 years ago and uh, it's still going. <laughs> wow. Um, we've had a couple comments. Um, Carol just said, thank you for a great presentation. Yeah. Um, somebody else commented that the Southern Poverty Law Center attracts hate groups. Yes. Um, a couple people have asked sort of what inspired Rockwell's anti-Semitism? How did he go from fighting the Nazis to becoming um, a Nazi leader himself? Like what influenced him? Well, he's he was a real black sheep uh, in his family. I mean, you would never have predicted this. So there was a theory that he had a mental illness and uh, William F. Buckley uh, wrote about that in the National Review in the early 60s. And they even had a psychiatric evaluation of him. Uh, so he, you know, he's attracted to power. He's attracted to regalia. And as I said earlier in my sort of amateurish uh, diagnosis that he, he got a charge out of shocking people. And uh, that's not something, a trait that most of us have. And most of us are more, much more sensitive to uh, people's feelings uh, in, in reaction to what we say, so. And um, let's see, Bryna, you have your hand up. So I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Yes, um, uh, I've got an anecdote. In 1966, I was doing, I was 16 and I was doing a research paper on anti-Semitism. So I went down, I went into DC and used the library at B'nai B'rith International, which is a, an international Jewish uh, organization. Mm -hmm. And at that time they were uh, up near national, where National Geographic is now uh, behind the, the Mayflower Hotel. Anyway, um, I went in and did my research all, frantically all day, trying to get this paper done. And I came out and lo and behold, the entire building was uh, was circled by, by, a, by Nazis marching back and forth. With oh, their wow. Epine Brief. Wow. And, and this, I have to say it was the largest, the, this, DC policeman came up and, you know, said, don't worry, little girl. I, mean, he, he, I to this day, I think he was the largest policeman I'd ever seen. I, I would have sworn he was like seven feet tall. And meaning I was just so terrified. And he said, now, don't you worry. Uh, uh, we're, you know, he asked where I needed to go. And he says, I will walk you there. Wow. Good for him. Yeah. Well, it got really, he, he said, and, and, and we're walking. He says, and you see, he said, you know, you see, he, he said, now you see how they're walking? Now, if they, they, they have very strict rules on where they can walk, they put one foot over the, <laughs> out of where they're supposed to do, and I'm going to beat their heads in. <laughs> he, and he told me all about his brother had been a Marine in the Pacific, and he was absolutely incandescently furious that wow. these people were marching with American flags in his town. <laughs> And I mean, the other six, the other policemen who were there were also, I think, equally upset. It was, but I had, I, I don't know. It was just, it was that. Uh, and I think I got caught one more time during an anti-war demonstration going through Roslyn. The bus got circled by Nazis and there were all the tourists on the bus and they're looking out the window at them and I'm diving for the floor. <laughs> Well, you know, it just reminds me that uh, the original Nazis used fear uh, and a lot of their symbolism and torches and uh, nighttime rallies and, uh, you know, uniforms that um, stood out uh, were um, designed, you know, like the, remember the, the SS, which is a military unit, but it has the lightning bolts. It's the, the idea of uh, fear and, and it, it can make uh, regalia and uh, uh, other symbols can make a sort of a very average looking man look more like of a threat you know it instills fear in people well, we and were, they, they, I, they capitalize on that I don't remember the, the, there was a one of the there was a student at Falls Church High School He's, uh, he was 
I think he was going to be valedictorian one year, and that would have also been. And he and so they, he was shot through the the house window, and that everyone was saying it was because the person who shot him didn't think a Jew should be valedictorian of a Southern high school. Oh wow! So we, we may have been paranoid, but we had we were we were crazy. All right, thank you, Bryna, for sharing your story. Um, let's see, we have quite a few questions left. I know we're over time, so I'm gonna try and <laughs> zoom through these. Uh, when did the Nazis leave the location on Wilson Boulevard near or above the coffee shop? 1983. 1983. So they were there from 68 to 83 there in uh, Courthouse Clarendon. All right, Lucas, and were the, yeah. oh, go ahead. Well, there was a dentist and, and former county board member, uh, Lucas Blevin, his name finally came to me. He's the one who uh, shared the building with them and was was not happy when he figured out who they were after they signed a lease and all that. Hmm. And someone asked, uh, were the neo-Nazis in Charlottesville in 2017 the successors of Rockwell's group in Arlington or was it a, a separate group? I, I haven't seen a direct connection. Uh, you know, with the internet nowadays, they don't have to go learn the Arlington history in order to get interested in the Nazis. And, you know, there's a lot of uh, neo-Nazi groups in Idaho. It's interesting. That's where uh, a lot of uh, Idaho, I don't want to disparage the state of Idaho in case there's some Idahoans in the audience here. But I mean, it's a very uh, white uh, population there uh, demographically. And so there's a lot of uh, racist types who gravitate to that state, which is not to say everybody there is a racist, but you get my drift, so. Mm -hmm. um, in a similar thread, uh, was there any overlap with the KKK, which was still active in Arlington in the late 1950s? Yeah, uh, and the, the, the KKK was uh, renewed a little bit in the, in the, certainly in the 20s, but then in the, in the 50s and 60s in reaction to the civil rights uh, era. So uh, there were some uh, members of the Nazi party who also joined the KKK. One of them was the Stan Burroughs, the, uh, the, the one who committed suicide when it was revealed that he was actually Jewish. So yeah, it would attract the same sort of uh, drifters, I would say. But you also got to remember that um, Virginia was a segregated state in the 1950s and early 60s. And the schools, as you, you all know, Arlington was the first to have a school at a grade in 1959. So, uh, and Rockwell, you know, he got 6,300 votes running for governor. So there's, you know, it, it's not like uh, uh, racism was a, was a thing of the past. I mean, there was, there was some overlap with mainstream uh, uh, conservatism or, or just uh, people who accepted the status quo, which included segregated schools. And that was one of the big issues for Rockwell was to keep the schools segregated. Hmm. And um, speaking of the, the Jewish member of the Arlington Nazi party, someone asked if you could tell us a little bit more about that, about his story. Well, there's a book by two New York Times uh, reporters, um, Arthur Gelb uh, about Dan Burroughs. And uh, he and Patler uh, were, became close friends and they were both from New York and had trouble had troubled childhoods. And so uh, they kind of shared that uh, on again, off again relationships with Rockwell. So, but you, you can find that book on uh, Burroughs. And uh, the subject of my column tomorrow is a, uh, I might as well give him a little promo. Uh, I met a, a Washington Lee graduate from 1971 and he, uh, uh, interviewed Patler in 1971, and it was published in the Washington, then Washington Lee, of course, now it's Washington Liberty High School, but it was uh, published in the Penman, which is the literary magazine of uh, WNL. And uh, I was very impressed with this writing by an 18 year old. And he talked all about the history of Rockwell, the history of the American Nazi party, the history of Patler and the history of uh, uh, Dan Burroughs. And, and uh, also the uh, successor to Rockwell, Matt Kale. 
who, uh, like I say, did not have the uh, charisma that Rockwell had. Interesting. Um, Yolanda shared a story. Uh, she said circa 1975 from her 12th floor Crystal City office, she saw twice Nazis marching at the corner of Route 1 and 15th Street, um, and they were not very well received, especially since uh, they were marching during rush hour. <laughs> uh, and uh, she said she thought they wore khaki pants and shirts with white belts, um, and they carried wooden guns, also white, over their shoulders. Incredible. Crazy. Well, just imagine what it's like if you were a veteran of World War II, and here you are in, it's only 14 years earlier, you know, that these Nazis are wandering around and you were fighting them uh, to cross the Rhine in, uh, in 1945. You know, it's just so strange that all this could, uh, it's another example of, you know, maybe Rockwell was mentally ill, you know, the idea that you could pull that off, uh, not yeah. for the uh, for the meek. <laughs> All right, we have two written questions left, and then two people with their hands up. Um, so, one question that we've gotten from a few people is a sort of again that question of how the community received them. Um, was there any evidence that the Arlington community was uncomfortable with the Nazis living in their community? It seems like they were passively resigned to the situation. Um, Someone pointed out that there is a bunch of pro-Nazi sentiment in the country before the war started. Um, yeah. And th someone else asked how World War II veterans viewed this, um, especially since Rockwell was a veteran himself. Right. Well, remember that uh, America was slow to get into World War II. It was only Pearl Harbor that, that cemented the deal. There were isolationists in the 1930s, and Roosevelt had to do Lend-Lease to help the British because they couldn't get Congress to uh, actually send weapons directly uh, to the Brits and, and the French. And uh, there's um, there were American Nazi gatherings, pro-Nazi, the Bund met in uh, Madison Square Garden in New York. So, so you had some of that. And uh, I guess you have a lot of people in um, who may agree with you know, Rockwell sort of saying out loud what some of them feel privately about things like keeping the uh, uh, schools segregated and uh, not much sympathy for blacks. And so when I think of the concerned citizens group, you know, these Jewish families and the Presbyterian minister, they're, uh, they're not, uh, most people are kind of apolitical, you know, in, in the 50s and 60s, people are relaxing and the wars are over. And they want to uh, do barbecues in Little League. This is the way I grew up, and uh, they 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 don't want uh, this anger. Uh, so I think that the concern citizens' concern had an, an an uphill battle to get attention paid, and uh, this is why Obermeyer I think did such a good service in continuing to cover them in the uh, Northern Virginia Sun. Hmm. All right, one last question from the Q and A, and then I have two people with their hands up. And then we'll wrap up. Um, Eileen asked, uh, and this is a question I actually had too, is there any connection to Norman Rockwell, the artist? No, there's not, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> He's asking. from Massachusetts and uh, George Lake and Rockwell, they're from uh, Maine, basically, so. All right, and um, Jean, I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Oh, I, I was just going to make a comment about the um, uh, Southern Poverty Law Center. Yes, go ahead, Jean. Oh, I was just, I, I was just, um, uh, I'll reiterate that the Southern Poverty Law Center uh, tracks hate groups, and it's really fascinating to see their statistics because there are a lot of them in our area. Yeah, and when I started out on this, I was more interested in Arlington as an Arlington guy, but I realized that the, 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 there's a whole study of, of hate groups nationwide. And uh, like I say, the History Channel is always doing you know, updates on it. And I find that a kind of a depressing topic, you know, so I don't really wanna spend my life uh, becoming an expert in all these hate, hate groups, but I had to do a certain amount of it to, to just to keep my Arlington story uh, vivid. So thank you, Jean. Sure. 
Yes, thank you. And uh, Carmela, I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Uh, yes, Charlie, I wanted to mention that the uh, Rockwell's group was sort of informally known as stormtroopers yeah. because during the mid 1950s when Arlington filed a suit with the S Supreme Court to desegregate the schools here in um, May, May 14th of 1966, uh, uh, which was two years after the Brown versus Board of Education yeah. decision was handed down and schools here were still desegregated the Unitarian Church on George Mason Drive and Route 50 would hold group meetings there of those in support of desegregation um, in Arlington County, specifically of the schools. And the, the uh, members of uh, Rockwell's group would come into these meetings and disrupt them Wow. They would wear heavy steel-toed boots and they would carry weapons and they would interrupt the meetings and stomp their feet collectively. And they sounded so much like thunder. This is what my mother um, has told me several times. They sounded so much like thunder. They would scare the children and disrupt the meetings. So they became known as stormtroopers. Very interesting, Carmel. The other thing is that um, there was a house that they occupied right across from the football field of Washington Lee High School, known as at, by that name at that time. It was an ugly green house, which was just torn down in 2017. Yeah. I know that house, yeah. Yes, yes. And when a lot of the African-American students would walk by en route to school, they would get harassed. The other thing I want to mention real quick, ironically, with the 1976 Bicentennial Parade, that year, the John M. Langston Citizens Association had a float that was entered in the parade, and that float depicted famous African-Americans going back to Mary McLeod Bethune. And uh, it, it, was, it was a whole group of, of people. I won't take up too much time talking about that, but the irony is that float won uh, an award in that parade. So it's just so interesting that that was the same event that uh, Rockwell and the American Nazi party participated in also. Well, thank you, Carmela. And well, you mentioned your mother, that would be Dorothy Ham, would it be? Yes, sir, I do yeah. believe. Name for the school is now named for her. So, yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Carmela. Um, we have one more question come in. Um, do you know the name of the rabbi at the Unitarian Church? I'm so sorry, I don't. It's yeah. very random, yeah. All right, and those are all of our questions. So um, thank you again, Charlie. Um, I guess if, if there's one question just to wrap up, if people have anecdotes that they want to share with you afterwards, can they reach out to you or yeah, so are you I'll still doing you your research? I'll give you my email address. And uh, Mr. Fogarty said he had the uh, pamphlet. I'd be interested in seeing that. So you can reach me on AOL.com. My, my email address is cclarkjed. That's C-C-L-A-R-K-J-E-D-D. -D at AOL.com. All right, thank you so much. And thank okay. you everyone thank for you joining all. us. I enjoyed it very much. Yeah, I hope you all have a great night.